Hello, and welcome to Lopes on Movies. My name is Joey Lopes, and today I am joined by Connor. Good morning. <laughs> good, uh, good morning. <laughs> and, and, and Mark. Oh, and maybe I should do that. Should I do that again? Nah, nah. No, no, okay, should I do a really deep voice to make up for your, uh, your voice and, crack? I'm sorry, the deep voice bit's over. <laughs> it was ruined. It was ruined by, you know... Well, I, I think Connor was deliberately doing an anti-deep voice bit. I see, I see. As a result. Well, anyway, how you guys doing? You know, we're here to, to talk about, you know, I guess talk about movies. Um, how, how have you guys been doing lately? Oh, just great. Oh, good. You know, it's uh, sep- September 30. Holy, what? 2020. <laughs> yep. That's true. And, you know, it's a little bit cloudy today, but, you yeah. know, with any luck, there'll be those clouds will burn off and there'll be golden sunshine and we'll have a beautiful day. Have a Are great day. I'm in LA everyone. right now. <laughs> Man, what a, uh, what a way to start this episode. He, uh, he pretty, pretty much said it all right there. Uh, <laughs> all right. I, I, I mean, I think we, we all can agree that this has been the, the weirdest year for movies ever. Mm-hmm. In, in that we we don't know what to watch. There's nothing new to watch. Sometimes there's something there's some stuff new to watch, but it's all over the place. You know, it's not like the Weirdest nice year in general. Well, it's yeah, I, yeah, I guess that's true. Um, <laughs> but we're a movie show, so we're gonna focus on that aspect of of 2020. Um, but I mean, it used to be so easy. You know, like the the mo- movies would come out every week. You see what a new thing that came out every week, every weekend. You know, whatever. And then it, it was so simple. But now everything's up in the air. So I think for for a lot of us sitting at home, a lot of what we've been we've been consuming, I think, is just like online content that checks out. Like for me, during quarantine, I was way into just like killing time by watching YouTube videos. I don't know about you guys, if you guys did like similar things, like once once stuff started locking down. Yeah, I mean that or. Uh... I played video games for mm-hmm. times, which mm-hmm. I have. I don't. I don't. I'm not a gamer or anything like that. I just, just anything, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think the interesting thing about that is that the a lot of people were starting to produce content for the internet when this this whole thing first started. So you had all of these like celebrities, for instance, like doing all of these like online shows and stuff. Um, as soon as like the lockdown started, like remember John Krasinski was doing some stupid thing, like every, yeah, and then week? he sold it for a lot of money. Oh, did he? I didn't even <laughs> realize that. Well, yeah, it was something like some. It was called like some good news, and then he sold it to a network for a lot of money, and he's no longer going to be a part of it. So I'm I'd glad he made a profit of off of that. <laughs> wow, wow. Well, how yeah. about that? That came and went. But I think all of us can agree that. If there's any online content that has come out of this lockdown that deserves the crown of best online content that mm-hmm. exists, mm-hmm. it is, of course, what one of our favorite filmmakers, David Lynch, has been doing over mm-hmm. the past few months. Um, now, we, we talk about David Lynch a lot on this show, but we haven't really ever talked about his movies to any significant degree. Um, yeah. And I think th- this episode, the the idea was like, you you know, because of how often we talk about David Lynch, we figured, you know, we might as well just do an episode talking about this guy, so that people what listening to this show understand why why we keep on bringing him up. Um, now the in terms of the the online content world, the YouTube world, uh, Connor mentioned at one point that he was doing this thing called the the number of the day, where. <laughs> Every day he would he would stand in front of the camera with a with jar full of balls that have the numbers one through ten written on them. Twirl them around. Yeah, just swirl the numbers. Swirl the numbers. <laughs> um, and he would at random reach in pick very a deliberately. Yeah, and uh, whatever whatever number he pulled out was the number of the day. Um, yep. Now you wouldn't think that this is compelling content, but <laughs> the, the the this whole like weird subculture started to come about as a result of this largely because ever since he started which was like 
Oh, I think at least a month. Oh, at least a, like, a little more than a month ago. Uh, like forty days. Yeah, or it's so. been something like that. Well, and that's that's in addition to what he's been doing since like the quarantine started, which he also yeah. did once a time, like uh, you know, years ago, which is his daily weather report. Right. Where yeah. He'll yeah. he'll give He'd you the weather in, in L.A. every single day. Yeah. From he always his little bunker office. He always tells he you what the weather's video like. Blog too. Yeah. He tells you what the weather's like, and he says like what's on his mind that day. Yeah. Uh. So that that's also great content. But the number of the day thing is interesting because of just the community that surrounded this this YouTube channel that he put up as a result of this thing, because ever since he started, he was never pulling the number seven. Yes. <laughs> and this is fascinating, like, just in terms of probability, where it, when it started getting to, like, you know, 30 days and he's never pulled a seven, it's like, this is insane. How could this guy not pull a seven? <laughs> and there's this one guy in the comments, Wes, of the YouTube videos, who would, who every single day would say, man, if tomorrow's not a seven, I'm going to lose it. Right? And so everybody would read that comment and then comment themselves being like, oh, man, poor Wes is going to lose his mind. When are we going to get a seven? He's going to lose on? it, dude. You know? He's, exactly, he's going to lose it. Um, and then just a couple of days ago, like, the, the magic happened. You know, it was, it was the normal routine as usual. You know, he, he puts his hand in the jar, he swirls the numbers, he picks a number. And even though during this whole process, he usually has, like, the most ridiculous, stoic, super serious face on when he picks the number, he couldn't help but crack a smile when he pulled that seven for the first time and said, <laughs> Wes... <laughs> Today's number is seven. It was a. I can only imagine what that would be like. I mean, a, it took dedication to be that, <laughs> like that, focused on getting a seven, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. to just have your own name dropped. I, I'm double checking right now. I was a little distracted because I wanted to see if Wes ever commented on that video. <laughs> and it doesn't. Enough, he it doesn't not. look like he did. No, Wes disappeared yeah, after was, the seven was was pulled. I, that's very mysterious. It, the mystery opinion. of Wes is uh, is something. But yeah, like yeah. <laughs> the thing that's incredible too is like this got attention from like uh, I looked the other day like the Guardian wrote an article oh, about yeah, the seven yeah. being pulled. I saw that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> a bit of a slow news day, I guess. No, this is just important. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the, I I think the uh, the larger the larger point is like this this whole thing is just one of many strange and bizarrely compelling aspects of david lynch as an artist um even not not even talking about his movies but just his his personality and like the the persona that he puts out to the world is so endlessly fascinating and uh i think i, I mean at least for me i think david lynch is like in, in terms of just people one of one of the good ones you know, <laughs> he's one of the greatest fascinating to just listen to ever. talk. Yeah, like, he's got so he I actually have heard he doesn't consider himself a very good storyteller somehow, but every single interview and behind the scenes like thing with him is just absolutely wonderful. Like, oh, yeah, he's so, so good at telling weird stories about stuff that's happened to him. Mm -hmm. Um, Things that are one, so simple, though, too, at the yeah. same time. <laughs> yeah most of them i mean like even the george yeah. lucas one that's like <laughs> a pretty george normal lucas. story he just kind of like went to get a salad with george lucas and talked to him about like well directing star wars two seven wait no nah, it was uh, return of the jedi five <laughs> yeah um but the way he tells it is just so compelling because it's just like it even has like just that through line of his headache just getting worse and worse throughout the day listening to george go on about wookies and stuff like that yeah I, I highly recommend anybody who's never seen that to look up david lynch and and george lucas and listen to him tell that story because it's it's a wonderful video also his really, yeah. the video of him explaining his opinion on watching movies on iphones um that's another <laughs> another infamous uh clip but it's really watching incredible. a film on your telephone. On your telephone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the way yeah, he just yeah. they ask him about it, he's like, but if you try to watch a film on your telephone, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, I think You'll never in a trillion years. <laughs> uh, he's got yeah great. very strong opinions that are the right one about. <laughs> yeah. the, but uh, you know he, everything he says though he's watching. 
he does it in such like a like a with such positivity though like you never dislike anything about him like it, and like it must be hard to interview him but he doesn't do it in a way that's like insulting or anything like that oh too. no definitely but not. like it, like people will try to interview him all the time and maybe they don't get who he is exactly or fan questions will come in like they'll mm-hmm. ask him about a specific thing in his films and he just will say no that he's not going to answer it or <laughs> yeah or like the question will be like very direct so what was your inspiration behind this and he'll just say you know no <laughs> or like yeah. you know, i mean he was like, into it <laughs> well actually this goes to something i wanted to talk about in a little bit but his book covers that he he straight out says the obvious answer to that question is the, the like whole concept is he's got movies for you to watch his he, he cannot recapture what it is that he put into those movies in his own words in the way that you could get just having that experience yourself Mm -hmm. like in in his own way his creative process is very meditative and draws a lot on the subconscious so Mm -hmm. he's more about trying to capture those things on a much deeper level than what you'd be able to easily put into words and like Mm -hmm. obviously you can talk about what twin peaks is about at its core or what mulholland drive is but it's not the same thing as i mean especially it's it's one thing if we talk about it and we say what we think it is but if he says it then it automatically becomes part of the canon and he doesn't Mm -hmm. want that it takes away from the work itself right yeah i think uh my my favorite way that he's described it is when he compares his films and film in general to music where I mean, when you listen to a song you're having like a direct emotional reaction to the song right especially if we're talking about a song with no lyrics you're just listening to an instrumental piece of music right that music is going to affect you in some way it's going to have some emotional effect on you that's purely like it, it, it lacks any logic, right? You can't tell. You can't mm-hmm. tell me what what story that song is telling you. You can only tell, like, say what the emotions are. So you come to some kind of internal understanding of the piece based on your own reaction to it. And he says that films really have the same quality, and in, it, it makes a lot of sense if you if you think about it more abstractly. Like both music and and film are you know, artistic mediums that take place in elapsed time, right? You just, you you can get the same kind of raw experience from a movie that you can get from listening to a piece of music. But because I think there's so much emphasis from people on the the storytelling and the, the screenwriting aspect of film that they think of it in terms of like logical story, right? They want to understand it. They want to be able to to look at the story in a plot summary and feel like, it like it, like it makes sense right? that they got the experience right. from it and that's just yeah. not what what movies are about it's not what anything is about now I, I, I would argue not just david lynch's movies but movies in general like i feel like you're not really like talking about a movie is very different from actually experiencing it in the moment and reacting to it in the way that you personally can react to it because it's always a give and take right when you're watching a movie listening to a piece of music it's always your personal experience and the movies whatever it's portraying coming together to form some kind of understanding and i think mm-hmm. that's a really beautiful thing and it makes yeah. a lot of sense to me just that not only just as some, like a musician but as a person that loves music and understands music in that way i see no reason why we can't see movies that way um so yeah I, i've always i've always loved that explanation and and to me it's it's made watching movies a more pleasurable experience because you're not as worried if you don't necessarily fully understand what's happening right like i feel like people get hung up on that sometimes where like they're watching a movie i think that's and, a major issue people have yeah. with this especially lynch because his works are so abstract and yeah. so strange while still not necessarily being anything all too they're not like puzzles or something that you'd need to piece together and sit for hours and hours and contemplate what every little Mm -hmm. image means you can just kind of let it wash over you and get what you get out of it yeah exactly instead of i think people get hung up on that when things end up a little too on the abstract side it happens with books it happens with any like graphic novels it Mm -hmm. happens with everything Mm -hmm. um where when you go too weird 
people start thinking that it has to make sense in some fashion more than an own, its own limited internal logic requires. Mm-hmm. Like, right. you don't yeah, need it's... to know more than the white and black lodges in, in Twin Peaks to really get what the story is about. Mm-hmm. You can just enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. yeah. The simplest level. way that I could describe it is it, it might not make sense in your head, but it does make sense in your heart mm-hmm. and it feels right. You yeah. Know? Mm-hmm. And it just, you just have to trust yourself. You know? you know? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it, uh, David Lynch, from when he started, you know, making, making films from, you know, way back going all, all the way back to Eraserhead, he, he was considered like, very different and abstract then and i don't mm-hmm. think anything has really changed it's the mm-hmm. thing that's pretty amazing about him like mm-hmm. he's had this opinion about the way film should be and the way his his style and he's kind of always kept that uniqueness to him that is that is so impressive like and there mm-hmm. are filmmakers that are that are more like this but you know it, the industry definitely didn't go the same way as him in any way and he definitely has his clear clashes with the industry oh, yeah. that are yeah and he's yeah, very course. vocal about it too it's not is, like uh, it has wide appeal either and i'm not saying that it is a good or bad thing that it has limited appeal to it like the people that are gonna like his work are gonna be drawn to it at some level and i don't expect anybody on this kind of wavelength or or other ones that i don't necessarily get as much i'm trying to think like the guy who did dogville is another obvious example, maybe. Oh yeah, What's um, yeah. where there's just like stuff that's so weird that a very limited amount of people are going to care for it to begin with. That's fine. I mean, it's nice to have things for everybody. It, like, I th- I feel like some people are going to have a much greater connection with mm-hmm. works like this than they would to ones that are more generalized. Yeah, I think everybody has something like this for them. For sure, and yeah. It just so happens we're in that Lynch camp, I guess. Like, I think the, the thing that, that I always think about it is that I, I don't consider David Lynch's works really inaccessible. I just think it requires a certain reframing of your priorities when you're watching because he's still telling stories, right? Like, he's not just putting a bunch of abstract images on the screen. Yeah, no, it's not that just have nonsense. no content, t- context, yeah. right? Like, he's still telling stories. It's just that the stories that he's telling are mostly told visually and aren't necessarily something that can be perfectly explained in words. Like, you you can get an emotional understanding and then kind of in your head go like, okay, I guess this is basically what I'm seeing. This is basically the, the, the gist of what I'm getting. And then really in the moment, it's just how does that make you feel? What does that make you think? Yeah. You know? And I don't I think, think that's of, really, really inaccessible. I just think it, it's, it's not the same thing as watching, you know, any standard Marvel movie or you know, whatever, whatever. You yeah. Want. Well, I don't. Yeah, I don't need. <laughs> but I think the idea is along the lines of a dream logic, where when you're in the middle of a dream, you just kind of go with the flow, mm-hmm. and if something happens and i don't know you're standing on the ceiling you just kind of accept that it was always that way yeah it's just like that's the kind of mindset you need to have in a like lost highway or in yeah. mulholland drive i think that's how you kind of have to approach lynch movies like mm-hmm. like they they have that dream logic where it'll be basically internally consistent it's not just random imagery and random scenes strung together Mm -hmm. it's got like a lot of really pretty interesting themes in it but they aren't necessarily told straightforward yeah yeah and i I think that's something that once you kind of refocus your your priorities when you're watching it can it's just an incredibly rewarding emotional experience um Mm -hmm. but i all right, let's uh, l- let's let's get to some specifics here. Well, I have an interesting question. If we don't want to dive into movies on this episode, well, what's your question? Um, let's hear it. Do you know? So I assume you know where he came from in terms of the beginnings of his career in general. But do you know how he ended up getting into movies? Um, I I know the gist of it, but he he's very vague about yeah the, uh, the experience. He basically like he he was an art school student. And yep. he was primarily a painter, I believe. Mm-hmm. And he 
at one point was looking at a at like a painting that he he made and he imagined it moving and he was like ah moving paintings and then yep. somehow from there he was making movies <laughs> well no no i i know what the connection was he actually covers it in his book oh, does um he? catching the big fish i've been reading it it's really good it's um actually a pretty slim volume it's got it's not quite autobiographical it kind of jumps around and it's like two page chapters it's just like david lynch covers a thought moves on to the next one <laughs> gotcha so he talks about his time in art school where he was a painter and i don't know if it was like a push for him to do this but from that moment he actually made a small stop motion video of that painting displayed it in mm. class and an upperclassman loved it so much that he commissioned David to do one of those for a like party of his or something like that or as a gift mm -hmm. and basically he he never looked back since so if that random person didn't commission <laughs> another like stop motion video I don't think the ball would have gotten started. And honestly, I don't know about you guys, but I think there are some interesting David Lynch paintings out there, but I don't think they're as on the level of his film work. I think David Lynch, like his, his whole thing is, he describes it as wanting to live the art life. And mm -hmm. the, the art the, life. The, his whole like mindset with creating things is it's actually like you you can condense it very simply basically he 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 describes the initial process of any project as catching ideas right mm -hmm. like an idea mm -hmm. comes to him in some capacity whether he's you know just just randomly doing something or he's meditating or whatever he gets an idea and then that idea if it sticks around long enough he might as he describes like fall in love with that idea and be like wow this is a really good idea and then once he has that inkling, it's like, okay, now I want to take that idea and turn it into something, right? And what that something is could be anything, right? Like it could be a painting. It could be like a just craft project. He does a lot of those. Um, it, it, could be, it could be any idea or, or at the, the probably the highest level for him, it could be a movie, right? But he's not super concerned with what the idea is turns out to be it's just he catches an idea he loves and he wants to make it right mm -hmm. sometimes that's going to align with film work and sometimes it's going to align with something entirely different and it's not and it, for him it's not so much like an interest in being like a master of his craft or anything i think it's literally just he wants to be able to communicate the ideas that come to his head in some way he's chasing yeah, yeah. i mean the the interesting thing is i think his main focus is transcendental meditation mm -hmm. and what he seems to be going for. And he, the, the book is really interesting because it's not something that you only use for artwork or whatever, or movies in particular. It's about developing ideas. Mm -hmm. You don't get an idea fully formed. You start, and then it's sort of, you just kind of keep going. Like, um, apparently... Oh, gosh, I don't remember which movie in specific it was, but the end portion, like the very last puzzle piece for one of his movies came to him in a dream. And another one was just when he, he meditates every day, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes at night. Mm -hmm. and, and at some point, something just clicked with that. Uh, I think one of them, it, it's so interesting because it just seems like everything just sort of like snaps into place at some point. Like he was yep. leafing through a Bible one time and the end, that final last puzzle piece snapped into place for another one of his movies. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't remember the names of which goes to which. It might have been Eraserhead there, mm -hmm. actually. It was Eraserhead because that he was like, that's why I call Eraserhead my most spiritual movie, but I'll never tell you what Bible verse it was. <laughs> um, it is very interesting because it, it does kind of make sense because I think there is a good deal of subconscious influence on the creative process, and, and oh, he's yeah. about opening your consciousness up to a wider realm mm -hmm. of it, and... And not like like frying your brain on drugs, but through <laughs> meditation, it's actually pretty fascinating. Like, yeah, I think it's I know, uh, the way he describes it is yeah, so interesting. I feel like the way he describes it resonates very, very well with creative people. You know, like people that are trying to to develop things of their own and figure things out. Like, I whenever I read David Lynch's 
concept of catching ideas that just feels so incredibly like just awesome to me <laughs> you yeah know? and i highly feel, recommend yeah. that book to you and to the audience if there is anyone listening so with the <laughs> the little amount of time left i want to just ask the for for each of us what what's your favorite david lynch movie connor you start. can i say twin peaks oh okay <laughs> <laughs> mark go ahead <laughs> can i say twin peaks season three yeah he totally can. all right That's i'm gonna totally i'm fine. gonna claim yeah twin peaks season three that full 18 hour magnum opus is my favorite david lynch movie man if that like it, i'll be upset if that's the last thing that david lynch ever like directs in film but at the same time like oh man where does he have to go from what there? a masterpiece yeah. yeah that's i mean joey you and i we went to the museum of modern art remember they were doing like a screening of the entire mm-hmm. 18 hours in mm-hmm. in new york city obviously and <laughs> oh my gosh that what an experience that was because everyone there was just like a a huge film like fan and like just loved david lynch so much and it was just ah what an experience Magic. to see that on the like the big screen too uh yeah uh i really have a hard time deciding what my favorite david lynch thing it is, is. Tough. i i like I, I'm a big fan of all of them. And there's a lot of them that I haven't seen yet. Like I mean, not a lot, but like a handful that I haven't seen that I want to. And I do think that we should be doing that mm-hmm. this whole month. I think this this uh, might be David Lynch <laughs> month on Love Song yeah. movies. It could be yeah, good. This, this could be good. Yeah, this, yeah, this is gonna be Lynchtober coming. Are we gonna watch <laughs> Dune? No. Uh... Yeah. So I would say I love everything that David Lynch has done except Dune because that is what <laughs> David Lynch would say himself. And if yeah, <laughs> if he he's... ever was describing his things, he would go, you know, I everything I love everything except Dune. You know, because <laughs> he Dune to him, he said I think he said it was like such a sadness for him because yeah. of all the studio interference and he didn't get final cut on it, so it wasn't what he wanted, and. uh it just it just wasn't you know what he wanted at all but at least that did get us kyle mclaughlin which then we got blue velvet Mm -hmm. which is excellent and then from blue velvet we got twin peaks and then from twin peaks we got twin peaks the return and we got like so many amazing things i think Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the three films that i loved the most other than twin peaks you know the all of twin peaks that david lynch was a part of because there's parts of season two that are not (laughs) his his influence is not Mm -hmm. there clearly uh, but I really love Blue Velvet, Lost Highway, and especially Mulholland Drive mm-hmm. because it, with just how fascinating that is that it was originally a concept for a for like a TV show mm-hmm. that he had all this original footage and then he when that got I guess it was just you know it was not going to happen anymore he repurposed it into a movie that is probably just it is just incredible the way that the, the way he mm-hmm. was able to structure that story. Uh, and he also discovered Naomi Watts in the process of that as well. He's a the act, yeah, actors, actresses. They they love David Lynch too. He's the ultimate actors director. Clearly, oh yeah, people uh, yeah, people Joey. love working with with David Lynch because yeah, contrary he's, he's like, great, contrary yeah. to his reputation as somebody who can make some very like challenging and sometimes very dark films with some yeah. very like, serious and violent subject matter. He's apparently a very jovial. You know, the happy guy, you know? Yeah, actors and actresses in the interviews seem to just adore working with him. I mean, he seems, I mean, when he acts, he seems, he's playing, I don't think he can play, like, has he played a bad guy character in one of his own things? He seems <laughs> I can't, to I can't play it. very, very nice people. Yeah. <laughs> so, Joey, what's your favorite thing? I think to to wrap this up, because we don't really have a lot of time left, I'm just going to say pro- I probably would have picked Mulholland Drive. Uh, I'm I'm a, yeah. that's a good huge one. fan that's of that pick. movie and pick. for all the reasons that you said and many more. So I, I, the thing I don't that know, amuses guys. me I, about I, Mulholland Drive is that David Lynch has a very idealistic view of Hollywood, and Mulholland Drive is a very not idealistic <laughs> view of Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, oh, man. I'm like I wish we had more time to talk about this stuff, but unfortunately, we're gonna have to wrap this up. But don't you guys worry, because we are here to bring you. The, the first David Lynch October Lynchtober, you know whatever you want to whatever you want to call it, where we're gonna we're gonna talk about a couple of David Lynch movies throughout the rest of the month, and you know yeah. ho- hopefully turn you guys on to something new if you haven't if you haven't really watched a lot of David Lynch, and if you are a fan, well, maybe you'll enjoy our uh, our takes. There's some good spooky stuff in there, so it fits. All right, everybody, have a lovely morning. We'll see you next week. See ya. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>